Good evening. Welcome to tonight's AO Trauma North America Hand Education Committee webinar entitled Complex Infections. I'm the moderator tonight. I'm Jay Bridgman from the University of Missouri. And uh, I'm joined tonight by our hand education faculty, Dr. Kevin Malone from Case, West, excuse me, Case Western Reserve University, University Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio, and Dr. Kimberly Mazzara from Texas Hand and Arm Center, uh, Dallas, Texas. These are our disclosures tonight for our speakers that we want to make you aware of. And then this is just a content validation statement just uh, tells you a little bit about who we are, independent nonprofit uh, surgical education um, group improving the care of patients with musculoskeletal injuries. We don't endorse or promote any uh, products or commercial entities. Um, and the intent is to enhance uh, the learning experience for tonight's uh, education. So um, overall, our learning objectives tonight is to discuss the management for uh, infections in patients who are immunocompromised and have systemic illness, that the learner will be able to distinguish uh, treatment options for different mycobacterium infections, recognize the characteristics of necrotizing soft tissue infections, and that the uh, attendee will be able to develop a plan and alternative plans for treating complex upper extremity infections after tonight's webinar. Uh, this is our agenda. Dr. Uh, Mazzara is going to begin with infections in uh, systemically ill patients, immunocompromised patients, followed by Dr. Malone, who will discuss mycobacterial infections, and then I will finish with necrotizing soft tissue infections. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to pass the baton to Dr. Mazzara. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> And hopefully that's looks good. All right, does that look good? Everybody can see. Okay, great. Well, I'm I'm happy to be asked to talk tonight because I think this is a very important topic, and um, my uh, task is to talk about hand infections as they are related to patients that have systemic disease. We've kind of highlighted four particular patient population groups that have, have systemic conditions that. Um, we may all encounter, and it's helpful to understand kind of what you might see and how it will act um, as far as its clinical course. Uh, we're going to talk about the human, human and mineral deficiency virus, or HIV, <clears throat> which includes herpetic whitlow, HPV, fungal infections, and other scaling infections, uh, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and then the transplant patient as well. And there are some characteristics that are common that we need to be mindful of and I think are important to recognize. Uh, the presentations in these patients are often atypical. Uh, so you may see that there's a clinical course that you don't recognize. It may be typically more aggressive. Um, and because these patients do have compromised immune systems, uh, there is an increased susceptibility to more rare organisms or organisms that we don't usually see, but it can be very common in these immunocompromised patient groups. Uh, there's also uh, often delayed recognition of symptoms by the patient, which further complicates the matter um, due to different reasons. Um, in the diabetic patient, it may be a peripheral neuropathy um, that they just aren't aware of the discomfort or aware of a situation happening because of their neuropathy. And so that slows down their, their ability to get to us and to seek and seek care. Um, in the other patient groups, there's oftentimes uh, different behaviors such as IV drug abuse and social behaviors that may um, complicate and cloud a patient's ability to get to care quickly. Um, I think you have to have a high index of suspicion in this patient group. So you need to be, when you see them, you kind of get yourself into the mindset of, you have to think outside the box. Treatment is typically more aggressive um, than it would be in an immunocompetent patient population. Uh, and patients do need to often be treated promptly avoid a lot of long diagnostic delays because these uh, conditions and these infections oftentimes will kind of progress at almost at light speed, it seems. Um, and you have to think about more broad spectrum therapies and multiple drug therapies rather, you know, that you wouldn't typically use in your day to day. Um, so with that being said, let's kind of launch into the HIV patient population. Obviously, their uh, immune system is compromised in this patient group, and this is greatly simplified, but by a C CD4 uh, cell destruction and lack of function, um, the infections in this patient group tend to be spontaneous. They're more likely to not be caused by uh, trauma, 
um, by an injury, they're more likely just to just to be for no obvious reason they start developing a problem. And often they do require hospital stays that are maybe an increased length due to comorbidities. Um, because of the social behavior and the IV drug abuse in this patient population that can be associated, there is a higher infection rate with, with this behavior as well. Um, symptoms of presentation may initially look similar, but they may progress and they probably will progress very rapidly. So the clinical course is not what you're gonna expect. The most common presentation is an abscess, which in a immunocompetent patient would be kind of a later stage presentation, uh, but not so in the immunocompromised patient. This may be how the patient presents. So it can already be um, quite um, severe uh, just on initial evaluation. Uh, organisms, staph and alpha and beta hemolytic strep are still common. Um, oftentimes they take a back seat though. They may kind of present themselves rather than a primary infection. They may be associated with a secondary bacterial infection, which can happen on top of something that's more atypical like HSV or HPV, Canada, uh, cryptococcus. So there are different things that um, play a part. So you have to kind of think outside the box and be open to seeing not just that typical staph and strep that we kind of get used to seeing. Um, oral therapy mainstays still lie in Bactrim, Doxy, Clinda, uh, those medications as listed. And this patient here that's shown in this slide is a HIV positive patient uh, that had an, a bite, insect bite on the back of the hand. And this was like the first 24 hours. So you can see that it's just not your typical course. This looks like it would have been brewing for days in a typical patient population. But um, again, you have to just have that kind of heightened um, concern and um, monitor these patients. Herpetic Whitlow, also common in this patient population. We do see it obviously in immunocompetent patients, um, but um, it can be definitely more aggressive and more widespread. Uh, it's caused by HSV one and two. Um, diagnosis is typical by a smear or cultures. Uh, typically in a, an immunocompetent patient, we would always say, well, we don't IND this because um, it will typically run its course and we don't want to open and, and do an IND. But in the immunocompromised patient group, um, very likely that there'll be a secondary bacterial infection that will complicate the situation. So again, so that you may have to, again, think a little bit differently and just be have your heightened awareness of the fact that when you see this patient, they may indeed need an IND, even though it's a Whitlow, um, because of the situation and the underlying um, you know, immune system issues. Um, the treatment is typically is going to be acyclovir and its family. Um, so just again, not just watching it, not just letting it run its course as we might do uh, usually, uh, but just again, think um, more of aggressive treatment and um, addressing the situation that way. HPV is a, you know, we see that again to in, in patients that aren't immunocompromised, but typically it will be a solitary lesion or maybe a couple. And it will be not so clinically impactful on that patient's life other than maybe cosmetic. Um, but in this patient population, it can be actually quite uh, aggressive and have multiple um, sites and multiple um, lesions that spread rapidly. They can grow under the nail plate, uh, damaging the distal phalanx and become very um, painful there. Uh, and depending on location, whether it be on the palmar surface of the, of the hand or over a joint, um, it can be painful and can limit function. Um, and you can see this top slide here, this patient has um, pretty dramatic involvement of the hands and you can see functionally that would be a, a huge problem. So this again, you have to be the non-surgical treatment options that we usually are used to seeing um, may not be enough. Um, and recurrence rates are very high in the HIV patient population with a tr more traditional treatment. So I would say advise have a very low threshold to be more aggressive, surgically aggressive with this. And just on a side note, there is an association with squamous cell carcinoma. So that has to be, again, on your radar a little bit because uh, we don't want to overlook um, that problem, which can lead to amputation and um, more severe uh, clinical situations. Uh, fungal infections, 
extremely common uh, in this patient population. Canada is very common. And as you can see in the slide that's on the uh, upper right here, um, this is a Canada infection in a palm. Um, it typically has more of a chronic course in the HIV patient population, and it likes moist areas as well, but it has a very low cure rate with topical antifungals, uh, whereas in an immunocompetent patient, you would, would, would treat that way, of course. Um, in this uh, patient group, uh, systemic agents will most likely be required, such as itraconazole. Um, the cryptococcus um, is an encapsulated yeast. You can see this is an example in the bottom slide here. This patient has um, a cryptococcus infection. It does have a predilection for HIV patients. Um, it can manifest itself as a skin lesion, tenosynovitis, or even necrotizing fasciitis, um, depending upon the, the patient and their uh, situation. Uh, diagnosis is with biopsy and culture, and the mainstay of treatment is typically amphotericin B uh, with this. Some additional uh, fungal sporotrichosis. I mean, we maybe we'll see one or two uh, in our career, um, depending on where we live in as far as just in general. But again, in the patient population that we're discussing, um, it can be quite common and quite aggressive. Um, they can present with ulceration along the lymphatics and that typically can be very um, difficult to get um, control of. And typically treatment will be with itraconazole for three to six months uh, in, in, in involving surgical debridement as well. Um, coccidioedomycosis um, often becomes uh, systemic in this patient a group. Um, it can cause, as far as from the orthopedic standpoint, enhanced standpoint, synovitis and arthritis, um, which can be problematic to the patient. And a treatment, again, if there is a secondary bacterial infection, it would be a surgical treatment, and amphotericin B remains, again, the mainstay as far as medication. I'd like to mention porphyria um, because that is a highly unusual uh, condition, and it's shown here. You can see that there is uh, tense fluid-filled lesions with crusts and scars um, that presents, and it's associated with a high incidence in HIV patient population, and indeed in transplant patients as well, it can be seen. Um, but the point is, if you see a patient that has this, the patient should be tested for HIV if they haven't already been diagnosed. So there's that close of an association. And so I felt important to mention that point um, because as a hand surgeon, we may be the first um, interaction with a patient that hasn't been previously diagnosed. And this often is a presenting system, the system um, presenting condition. Um, in the HIV patient. Um, so just to have an awareness of this, and I don't know how many of you have seen porphyria, uh, but I, I can say I, it's, not, it's not common at all. Uh, lastly, scabies. Now we all know scabies and every, we know kind of the little uh, children and elementary schools and daycare centers and stuff. And this is a little, just a picture of what the little troublemaker looks like. Um, and typically it's not a big deal. It's treated um, and the patients do well, but just showing this slide here, if you look to the right, um, this is a patient that's HIV positive that has scabies and how it's become um, widespread in that patient's hand and obviously can lead to a secondary bacterial infection very quickly because of the scratching and the intense itching. Um, and that obviously it would then kind of create two problems. Um, ivermectin uh, tends to be the treatment and it tends to be, need to be aggressive, but also because of the secondary infection, it would have to be uh, kind of keeping in your mind that antibiotics and again, a kind of multi-drug uh, approach would be needed. Uh, PPE, uh, another um, finding in the HIV patient population, it's a rash. It's often associated um, with advanced, more advanced stages. Um, and again, it can be, it's excoriated, it can become secondarily infected um, with um, the bacterial problems. Um, as, uh, it may also be a presenting sign, just like we talked about the porphyria. This also may be a presenting sign in a patient that has not yet been diagnosed. And this may be an earlier sign. Porphyria tends to be a little bit later sign in the disease progress. So um, if a patient did just didn't have access to medical care, uh, they may present a little bit later. But in a patient that is still in the early stages of HIV and just hasn't been diagnosed, 
this may present and walk in um, to your clinic. And uh, if you are kind of mindful and you're aware of it and have that high suspicion, um, then you can get that patient treated appropriately. I'll move on to diabetes. Um, just in a very uh, simplified uh, statement, uh, basically the hyperglycemia causes a decrease in neutrophil activity, um, leading to problems with uh, chemotaxis and leukocyte adhesion, which cause problems. Um, in addition to this problem with the neutrophil activity, associated vascular disease compromises wound healing because of blood flow issues. So that's kind of the second uh, strike. Uh, and then thirdly, the peripheral neuropathy uh, that these patients often suffer with may lead to the delayed presentation. So that's kind of like strike three. Um, and the patients uh, present often with osteomyelitis or septic arthritis in the early stages. So seemingly like the disease has progressed quickly and you are kind of often may find yourself a little surprised by the, the involvement of the joint or the involvement of the bone. But indeed, that is not an unusual presentation in that diabetic patient. Uh, the infections here tend to be polymicrobial very commonly. Um, fungal infections are also common, secondary to uh, physiologic changes that are associated with hyperglycemia and the impaired macrophage act activity. Um, so in, some recent studies have shown that about half of the patients require repeat IND. So just not one IND, it may not be enough, um, which is about two times higher than the um, average in the immunocompetent patient group. Uh, and up to 12% can re require amputation, which is four times higher than the immunocompromised group. Uh, so definitely serious infections that progress rapidly. Um, Rheumatoid arthritis is another situation because of the drug therapy needed to treat this. That's kind of throws this patient group into the immunocompromised um, category. Uh, there can be these rheumatoid nodules, which often occur on the hands, and they can um, kind of ulcerate and become infected as well, which is something to keep an eye out for. Extensor tenosynovitis um, after a debridement, a wound healing can be an issue. Uh, so they, they can become infected. Um, and this patient here um, is a patient that underwent uh, silastic arthroplasties of the MCP joints and did well, but then developed a UTI and a kidney infection and hematologically seeded uh, the MCP silastic implants and now has infected joints. So again, not a typical uh, course, but having a high index of suspicion and, and kind of educating the patient too of, of things to look for um, is important. Um, I have a case that uh, uh, courtesy of Dr. Bridgman, he has a case that actually illustrates many of these points that we've been talking about. So I think it's worth running through and um, just understanding how these uh, clinical courses can progress. So this patient is a 41 year old female who presents to the ER with a swollen wrist, fever, nausea, vomiting, has a history of rheumatoid arthritis and is on the medications that are listed there. And you can see obviously that there's some swelling around the wrist. There's a, a faint erythema here, um, warmth and quite a bit of tenderness around that radiocarpal joint. Uh, white count was 8,000. Um, radiographs were shown here. And you can see that there are some mild changes in the carpus, but nothing super drastic, but definitely uh, something that doesn't look exactly normal. A uh, patient was also diagnosed uh, with a UTI. Uh, so she underwent blood cultures and a wrist aspirate um, up on her presentation. Uh, she, uh, from her blood cultures, grew out group A strep, as she did also from her wrist uh, fluid culture. She underwent an IND in the OR and was found to have purulence in the joint, in the wrist joint. Uh, cartilage was thin. Um, there was evidence of a, a ligament tear, the scapholunate, which may, be, have, may have been chronic. Uh, but her um, group A strep was penicillin sensitive, and so she was treated with ceftriaxone. Um, she did well, but three and a half months later, presented back again with new swelling and pain, um, no fever, um, and had these x-rays obtained. Um, and as it turns out, she had finished her antibiotics that she had been sent home on, and then restarted by her rheumatologist on methotrexate uh, three weeks later. Um, so. Um, her sed rate is 21, CRP is normal, uh, but you can see that there, if you look again carefully at these uh, radiographs, there have been quite a drastic change in basically a period of 
perhaps eight weeks, uh, 10 weeks or so, uh, maybe 12 weeks, um, that the drastic change. And then if we look further at some forearm films, uh, you can see that there's obviously some great concern of what's going on um, in her uh, forearm. And she presented with a very swollen forearm. Obviously there was even a concern at the time for uh, compartment syndrome. So she obviously had quite a bit of forearm involvement that was new. Uh, and we look at her carpus. Um, you can see that the carpus looks like it has basically translated ulnarly um, and is just um, not adequately positioned and definitely looks like there's been a lot of uh, damage to the uh, carpus itself. She also had an MRI done at this point, um, which showed changes as seen here in her radiocarpal joint, her midcarpal joint, her DRUJ. Um, she did go back to the OR and had another IND done. Cultures were uh, negative at this point, uh, but biopsy of the bone did reveal a chronic osteo. Uh, and um, patient at this point, uh, unfortunately, did not want to have a PICC line placed. And so she was sent out on Cipro and Augmentin as PO therapy. Um, and then the story continues. And this is, again, this is just kind of what happens in this patient population. It seems like everything goes uh, the wrong direction uh, despite trying to treat. She returned to the ER again. Now she has a draining sinus and her x-rays are shown as there. Um, SED rate's 22. She did have ultrasound and MRI done which showed a fluid collection and confirmed continuing osteo. And uh, she had a culture done, which showed rare gram positive cocci uh, at this time. So here we are, she's now six months. She has a non-healing wound of the draining sinus. Um, so, you know, this is a very challenging uh, patient population, a very challenging patient that's with, with her immunosuppression. And so the question, you know, we could have a, another discussion, but the, you know, where, where do you go from here and how to treat that? Is the patient need a resection? Does she need a cement spacer? Do we need to consider amputation? Um, anyway, so this just highlights many of the concerns and many of the problems. And Dr. Bridgman, maybe you would want to make a comment or have anything that you'd like to say. Yeah, I guess I, the, I wasn't directly involved as a treating physician, but I was asked to, in consultation to see this lady in clinic. <clears throat> and the issue that as I go back and look through the, the, the advan how rapidly it advanced, um, you know, you talked about even in your, uh, your talk about how sometimes things that we wouldn't necessarily think need to have surgical debridement uh, need to in an immu immunocompromised person. I think that was true for this lady. I think early on, as you see progressive collapse of the carpus, uh, we, we are kind of already knew from the first washout that she had, her cartilage was gray. She had, um, you know, just destruction in the carpus that uh, I thought that she needed really more bone debridement that didn't occur. And then later on that you can see it progressed across the endochondral plates to the distal radius distal ulna and then advanced eventually up to the uh, radius ulna. But these are difficult. And even the, even the patient was a little bit difficult. You know, there were times she didn't want to be in the hospital. There were times that she refused treatment plans like the PICC line and certain uh, antibiotics that we had uh, recommended. But um, I guess I would say, uh, although this, uh, she ended up seeking care at another hospital, she didn't uh, agree with our treatment plan. Um, the, the treatment, uh, you know, uh, learning from this one is just how rapidly it advanced and how kind of you have to be a little bit more aggressive early on. I don't know if, if Dr. Malone has any uh, thoughts. No, I think you've, you've highlighted the, the important issues and particularly is how aggressive and rapidly this can progress. Uh, and, you know, when, when patients aren't responding to normal course of treatment and continuing to progress, uh, something else has to be going on. You know, methotrexate, as was started, you know, certainly playing a role, but yeah. I think you have to be more aggressive uh, with your uh, management of these patients just to, you know, try to get a hold of what's happening and, and prevent, you know, this rapid progressive uh, destruction of multiple osseous structures in her arm. Yeah. 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 I was just going to say, as we transition uh, for time to Dr. Malone's talk, there was one question, uh, Dr. Mazzaro, that I was going to pose to you. Uh, this is from Dr. Mudgall. It's a, um, if you think about a patient with an acute uh, swollen DIP uh, and advanced uh, arthritis of the DIP, uh, if they're on a diuretic, is that acute gout versus sepsis? How do you approach this? So maybe a little bit of a complicated presentation. How do you approach a, an acutely swollen DIP of a septic joint versus may, maybe possibly gout? Right. So I think, I mean, history may play an important role in that particular 
clinical scenario um, that may help you a lot with understanding kind of which direction you should go with that. Um, X-rays may be helpful. Um, I can't say that I've done a lot of aspirating a DIP joint. I mean, other joints, yes, but the DIP, I mean, not that you couldn't, um, but um, I probably, I, I have to honestly say, I haven't done that a lot. I've, I've maybe gone by history by findings, I mean, in labs to look for, um, you know, some changes um, in, in any lab values. And then perhaps more of a, kind of an empiric uh, treatment plan for the DIP joint. Sure. Uh, maybe, yeah, a little bit more broad um, spectrum and kind of cover both bases. Sure. Um, but I think that's kind of how I've done it in the past, but not to say that you couldn't try to do some kind of a, a joint aspiration or flushing the joint, but I just haven't had success with it myself. But Sure. And it, I guess it, a lot of the, the DIP uh, gout cases, they may have TOFI already. So for example, I had a, a person who had uh, extensive gouty tophus uh, that eroded the skin and then they led to a septic joint as well. So they actually had both. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, that's exactly right. You can, you can definitely... And that's the situation with some of this. And I think, um, let me just go forward just briefly, just to finish up, um, just the take home points. Um, I, I think we, we kind of hit it, but just to see, we, we talked about these four patient groups and they all have different nuances to their treatment or different scenarios, but they all have one thing in common, they're immunocompromised. And so you can see uh, that's an important feature. And I've had, you know, speaking of our case that we just discussed, I've had residents um, you know, come and say, this is the most unusual thing. This is never seen it before. This is crazy. And I'm like, no, this is an immunocompromised patient. So this, this happens. So just having that awareness and the high index of suspicion that we've talked about, they may have delayed presentation, very rapid progression, expect polymicrobial and fungal organisms to be part of the picture, not to be surprised, just expect it. Uh, and atypical organisms. They typically will be deeper. They'll be septic joints already, or they'll be osteo already on, even on initial presentation. And one thing I would like to really emphasize is the white blood cell count, because we're so used to following that and it's so helpful for us, is not a reliable indicator of infection severity in this patient group, in an immunocompromised patient group. They just can't mount uh, that response. So having a normal white count doesn't mean anything in this patient group. So just be careful because we do tend to rely so much on that and just kind of, again, be mindful of that. And then don't be afraid to do empiric coverage. Don't be afraid to, to double, triple cover these patients and be aggressive on your surgical uh, treatment. Anyway, so that's... Uh... Looks good. All right, let's see. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so, uh, you know, before I move on, I, I encourage their participants to ask questions. The Q&A section uh, is there for you. Uh, and so you can post your questions and uh, we will try to address them through the remainder of the talk. Uh, I'm gonna focus here on mycobacterial infections and just to kind of lead on and follow, follow uh, on Dr. Mazera's presentation, you know, index of suspicion is super important and a team approach uh, to management of, of these infections is super important as well. Uh, you know, really relying on our infectious disease specialists uh, to, you know, help, uh, you know, deliver recommendations and to follow these patients because a lot of the management, uh, there, there's a lot of side effects to the management of these uh, infections. So I'll start with this case. This is a 53-year-old male who uh, presented to me as a third or fourth opinion uh, for a progressively swollen finger uh, on his non-dominant left hand uh, that had developed over a period of four to six months. Uh, he had seen, you know, probably two or three other providers and treatment had included uh, anti-inflammatory medications, uh, therapy referrals for edema control measures, and even uh, steroid injections. Uh, and despite all of that, his symptoms uh, persisted. Uh, for, and and then he presented to me with a, a swollen finger that wasn't overly painful, but just very difficult to move and, and impacted his ability to continue doing his job and other activities of daily living. So we'll get back to this case. And we're going to talk about uh, atypical hand infections, which are uh, by definition caused by uncommon organisms. And many of these patients are, are immunocompetent. Uh, so a different patient population than Dr. Mazera's uh, group of patients that she discussed. Uh, and the problem oftentimes is related to the fact that these don't present as clear infections. Uh, you know, these are gonna be nonspecific findings, not the typical canable signs or clear evidence of a, a perinicia or a felon. Uh, it's oftentimes uh, swelling, stiffness, a little bit of pain and, and progressively diminishing hand function. Uh, 
Uh, and this can lead to a delay in diagnosis and, and therefore a delay in appropriate treatment. Uh, the mycobacterium species, which we're going to focus on for the next couple of minutes, is responsible for many of these atypical infections. So in general, mycobacteria is a gram positive rod species, uh, and there are over 200 different species that have been isolated. Uh, these often exist throughout the environment, in water, in soil, uh, around livestock. Uh, they are obligate aerobic uh, organisms. Uh, and they have a unique cell wall, which really makes uh, you know, the diagnosis and also the treatment challenging. Uh, it's a hydrophobic uh, cell wall with a high lipid content. And because of this cell wall, these organisms do not stain with traditional gram stain techniques. Uh, we need oftentimes to use the zeal Nielsen techniques to uh, identify them. Uh, this is not specific to mycobacterium, but the other real problem is that it oftentimes takes six to eight weeks of incubation to identify a species. Uh, and oftentimes, as we discuss this, uh, therapy and treatment is initiated based on clinical suspicion before the actual results of the uh, specimens are obtained. PCR techniques can increase the turnaround time, but these techniques are not uh, readily available in all labs. Uh, and then the other component about this cell wall is that it can make it very difficult for most antibiotics to uh, impact uh, and treat uh, this organism. Uh, so oftentimes, uh, very prolonged antibiotic treatment is necessary with uh, specific agents uh, that can help penetrate uh, this, uh, this cell wall. So we're going to talk about several different uh, of the uh, mycobacterium species. Uh, the tuberculosis complex includes uh, mycobacterial tuberculosis, Africanum, and bovis species. Uh, pulmonary tuberculosis is certainly the most common form. Uh, but it can spread hematogenously to, uh, and then results in uh, musculoskeletal infection uh, and also can be the result of a direct inoculation uh, from a penetrating wound. Uh, oftentimes when present in the hand or the upper extremity or other uh, musculoskeletal components, it's not typically associated with an active pulmonary disease, uh, but there may be a history of a prior uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, again, this is a variable presentation. A uh, patient who is immunocompromised is going to have a more aggressive presentation and perhaps make it easier to uh, more quickly diagnose this patient. Oftentimes, the symptoms are pain painful or painless wrist and or hand and digital swelling. There may be a draining wound, if they're, particularly if there's been an inoculation. Uh, and oftentimes, with careful evaluation, lymphadenopathy can be identified. Uh, Tuberculosis of the hand has been subcategorized uh, into six different uh, divisions. Uh, cutaneous uh, is subcutaneous nodules with ulceration. Uh, tenosynovitis, which is the most common uh, presentation for mycobacterial tuberculosis and many of the other mycobacterial infections. And this more typically involves the flexors than the extensor tendons of the hand and wrist. Um, tuberositis, uh, arthritis, and osteomyelitis are all uh, relatively uncommon, but uh, if untreated, uh, can progress to. Uh, and then TB hypersensitivity is an aseptic arthritis in patients that have active pulmonary disease. So oftentimes, uh, you know, these are going to present with what looks to be a septic joint uh, and cultures will be uh, negative, uh, but it is a reactive process there. In terms of evaluation and treatment of these patients, certainly you want to get a history of, uh, of prior TB infections, uh, abnormal chest x-rays, uh, productive cough, weight loss, uh, lethargy. Uh, you want to have an evaluation of their immune status because, uh, you know, as, as we learned with the prior talk, uh, you know, those patients are more uh, at risk for developing some of these uncommon infections, which can uh, progress rapidly. Unfortunately, a lot of these patients can pre uh, have presentations that mimic many common conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or ganglion cysts, de Quervain's carpal tunnel syndrome, et cetera. Uh, and in many cases, steroid injections uh, are oftentimes utilized for an incorrect presumptive diagnosis, and these injections can exacerbate the infection. Uh, laboratory studies are not often helpful. Uh, you know, sederate may or may not be elevated. Uh, tuberculosis skin test uh, also has a relatively high false negative rate, particularly for musculoskeletal involvement. And x-rays are going to oftentimes show nonspecific swelling uh, and bone lesions, uh, only in the more advanced uh, presentations. So MRI can be really helpful for uh, mycobacterial infection evaluation. Uh, we'll see some inflammation, synovial thickening. We might find rice bodies. Uh, 
uh, in the flexor tendon sheath, uh, but these, these findings are not specific to mycobacterial. Uh, ultrasound with Doppler also can be helpful to uh, show the uh, in, uh, increased vascularity of the tendon sheath when the tendon sheath is involved, but really the key to make the diagnosis is biopsy, uh, and then uh, treatment can be initiated. Uh, you want to obtain cultures for all the normal things, aerobic, anaerobic, fungal, and mycobacterium, uh, but histopathology is key, and specifically for mycobacterial uh, tuberculosis, you're going to see this caseating granuloma uh, shown in high power up on the top right, uh, which is a, a large uh, area of, uh, uh, of uh, necrotic tissue surrounded by multinuclear cells, uh, and, and then these Langerhans giant cells seen on the bottom right, also uh, prevalent uh, in mycobacterial tuberculosis infections. So the AFB stains are oftentimes negative. Again, the cultures may take uh, many weeks uh, to uh, reveal any underlying organism. So typically the treatment is then initiated based on uh, presumptive diagnosis, clinical suspicion, and particularly the histopathology results. Uh, and treatment will be started typically before the culture reveals any abnormal results. Uh, in terms of treatment, synovectomy is oftentimes very helpful uh, in combination with prolonged antibiotic treatment. Uh, there are reports that antibiotics alone can help uh, and resolve these symptoms, but uh, the synovectomy can quicken the improvement of function, can lower the risk of complications like tendon rupture. Uh, and in patients with fulminant flexor tenosynovitis who have secondary nerve compression in the carpal tunnel, uh, this can uh, decompress that carpal tunnel and, and improve their symptoms. Many of the antibiotic uh, regimens range from six to 18 months, uh, and a lot of that is going to have an impact on the severity of the presentation, the immunostatus of the patient. Uh, and this is oftentimes a multimodal treatment overseen by the infectious disease consultants to monitor the effectiveness and also the side effects of the medication. And here you can see the, the first and second line uh, agents that are typically used for um, tuberculosis treatment of the musculoskeletal system. Moving on to uh, other uh, mycobacteria, the atypical mycteria, mycobacteria, otherwise known as uh, non-TB mycobacteria. Uh, this is typically a uh, direct from source transmission, so water or soil to the patient, uh, and uh, there are no reports of human-to-human -human transmission. Uh, the prevalence of hand involvement is often related to the abundance of synovium around the flexor tendon sheaths, uh, and the risk of inoculation from minor penetrating injuries as we are using our hands to interact with our surrounding environment. Uh, and here again, many of these patients are not immunocompromised uh, and symptoms are typically isolated to the affected body part. There are very rarely systemic uh, side effects or other systemic presenting, uh, presenting symptoms. Um, the symptoms here are oftentimes similar to the TB that was discussed previously, uh, nonspecific uh, swelling, um, discomfort, and maybe secondary nerve compression syndromes. Oftentimes, the, it, the, delayed, the diagnosis is delayed by many months, and over 20% of uh, patients uh, in many reports have uh, received steroid injections before the uh, correct diagnosis was made, and these steroid injections can have an ad, uh, adverse effect on, on the course of this treatment or the course of this uh, condition. In order to make the diagnosis like uh, TB, we need uh, biopsy and culture. Uh, and here, the difference between TB and non-TB mycobacteria is that in non-TB mycobacteria, we will see this non-caseating granuloma, so a uh, very cellular uh, granulomatous uh, material. Culture may be positive in only less than 50% of the cases. So here again, uh, the diagnosis is made, made based on the histopathology, the operative findings, uh, clinical suspicion. As we break down some of these, uh, you know, for the treatment, it's very similar to TB. It's synovectomy and antibiotics. There is no standard antibiotic regimen. So here, uh, ID consult is critical. Uh, and again, this is a very prolonged antibiotic course, uh, oftentimes up to and perhaps even longer than a year. And symptom uh, improvement may not uh, occur until over three months after initiation of treatment, which can make it very frustrating for the patient and the clinician to determine if the treatment was, uh, as initiated initially, was uh, appropriate. So we'll talk about several of the different non-TB mycobacteria. Uh, Mycobacterium marinum is the most common of these non-TB mycobacterial that, have, that can uh, involve the hand. Uh, the optimal temperature for growth is, uh, is cold, three to 30 degrees Celsius, and that's why it's more prevalent in the distal extremities. The hand uh, 
uh, and possibly the feet. Um, this is usually the result of a direct inoculation from uh, a penetrating wound, either by contaminated aquatic animals or open wound exposed to contaminated water. Um, symptoms can spread along the lymphatics, so it is important to evaluate for lymphadenopathy, uh, but uh, this is oftentimes swelling, uh, stiffness, tenosynovitis, uh, and then if uh, more advanced can progress to septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. And treatment here again, like the TB, is antibiotics and uh, surgery for synovectomy. The next species is Mycobacterium chelone, and I may be mispronouncing that. This is found in soil and water, uh, animals and marine life. This is a more rapidly growing organism, uh, but very similar symptoms to the marinum. Uh, flexor tenosynovitis is the most common presenting uh, symptom. Uh, again, absence of any systemic illness, blood work is typically normal. Uh, here, these, this particular organism may be resistant to some of the normal first-line treatments, uh, but many of them may be susceptible to clarithromycin. Mycobacterium kansasi, uh, found in water and in livestock. Uh, this oftentimes will present with pul active pulmonary disease and uh, hand involvement. Uh, again, flexor tenosynovitis is the most common presentation, and this particular organism has been found to have excuse me, resistance to rifampin and ethambutol. Uh, the Mycobacterium avium complex, which includes Mycobacterium avium and Mycobacterium intercellulare. intercellulare. Uh, here again, environmental sources, soil, water, uh, birds, fowl, swine, and cattle. Um, this we'll see more commonly in the patient population that Dr. Mazera discussed uh, of our immunocompromised patients with systemic illness. Uh, but can have uh, similar hand presentations and the treatment uh, is, uh, diagnosis and treatment is very similar with synovectomy and antibiotics. This particular organism may be uh, resistant to uh, common uh, medications used. Mycobacterium leprae, uh, this is uh, relatively uncommon except in certain parts of the world. 95% uh, of, our, of our world population is not susceptible to infection with this organism. Uh, this can occur through human-to-human -human droplet transmission and also from armadillos. So uh, down in Texas, Dr. Mazera, keep, a, keep an eye out for those uh, critter, critters. Um, infrequently, uh, the, because of the infrequency of, of this infection, the late diagnosis is often uh, common as is with the others. Uh, but this disease can affect uh, peripheral nerves, which can lead to very uh, significant uh, dysfunction. Uh, it can result in demyelination, axonal loss and neurofibrosis. And the ulnar nerve is the most common nerve involved, followed by the median and then the radial nerve in the upper extremity. Uh, there are two types of uh, Mycobacterium leprae, uh, the tuberculoid and lepro lepromatous uh, diseases. Uh, so in the tuberculoid, this is a more indolent, non-contagious form. Uh, we can see skin plaques on the uh, hairless body parts, so in the palm and the uh, forearm. Uh, and here, again, invasion of the peripheral nerves can result in loss of sensation and then progressive dysfunction. In the lepromatous uh, form, the skin lesions are much more extensive. Uh, peripheral neuropathies can be more aggressive, resulting in deformity and non-healing ulcers. Uh, treatment is, again, multimodal uh, drugs uh, listed here. Uh, and, and treatment here, you know, we talked with the prior ones, you know, maybe up to 16 or 18 months, but this may be several years of treatment. And the side effects of treatment are very common, uh, including neuritis, fevers, arthralgias, and skin lesions. And so for that reason, it's very important to have ID involved. Uh, surgical treatment for uh, Mycobacterium leprae uh, can involve uh, nerve decompression, uh, abscess evacu evacuation, uh, release of contractures, and then for uh, late reconstruction, nerve transfers, or even tendon transfers uh, to uh, address the paralytic muscles. So coming back to this initial case that we discussed at the beginning, this uh, four to six month history of painless swelling, uh, patient uh, admitted somewhat later that he had a freshwater fish tank, but did not recall any puncture wounds. Uh, I performed a tenosynovectomy. The picture on the top left shows how uh, prolific the tenosynovium is uh, within the flexor tendon sheath. Uh, the histopathology was consistent with non-caseating granulomas, uh, and so the presumptive diagnosis was of uh, a mycobacterium marinum infection. Uh, ID consultant uh, initiated a multi-drug therapy for about six months, uh, 
Uh, and while the patient still had, uh, you know, not complete range of motion return, uh, a much uh, more functional hand uh, and was able to uh, resume all normal daily uh, and work activities. So in general, mycobacterial infections are uncommon. Uh, they're they're nonspecific, vague symptoms. Uh, at presentation oftentimes lead to de delayed diagnosis and treatment. Uh, as a hand surgeon, you may be the first clinician to evaluate the patient. Uh, so it is very important to have a high index of suspicion uh, and to obtain uh, synovial biopsies uh, so that the appropriate uh, treatment can be uh, initiated. Uh, ID consultation and, and uh, team uh, approach is critical uh, for the uh, end result here to monitor the response uh, and the side effects and toxicity of our medications. Uh, a couple of references here. Uh, the, um, the middle one here is a more recent reference and it's uh, very, very uh, complete. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, Kevin, yeah, we do have quite a few of those armadillos in Texas, but due to their unfortunate attraction to all roadways, <laughs> <laughs> they do suffer a setback on their numbers. <laughs> a little bit. But I have a question from the audience for you. Um, the question was kind of in reference to how your philosophy is in treating hand cellulitis. The question is, should we treat um, hand cellulitis with IV antibiotics rather than just PO antibiotics in this, if you suspect this kind of infection situation? Well, so if it's just cellulitis, so not, not the infections that we were talking about, because most of the infections of the, of the mycobacterial source don't present with, you know, cutaneous issues here. Uh, but I think, you know, if, if the patient is immunocompetent and presents to the office with uh, a cellulitic uh, issue, I think that putting them on a course of antibiotics uh, for the typical organisms and then carefully monitoring their symptoms is appropriate. Uh, someone who may be immunocompromised, you might wanna be a little bit more aggressive and perhaps that patient uh, you know, should be admitted to the hospital to receive some IV antibiotics. Uh, I can tell you that a lot of times at our center, patients will present to the emergency department with cellulitis and they might get a dose or two of IV antibiotics and then discharged home with uh, oral antibiotics uh, with instructions for close follow-up. And I think that's just the key that, that these patients may need more frequent office visits to keep a close eye on them and, and uh, evaluation of their uh, immune status is critically important in other disease conditions. Thank you, yes, I agree. All right, I think I'll go ahead and uh, share a screen. And then uh, we're gonna finish with necrotizing soft tissue infections. So, um, all right, so I'm gonna begin mine with the case as well. This is a 30 year old female who uh, presented to our ER two days after having been bitten by a squirrel. Um, the history was very difficult to get from her because she was high on methamphetamines in the ER and she'd had you know, uh, several days of methamphetamine use, but um, she had essentially had been seen at an outside hospital uh, early on when she just had swelling and redness, and she received uh, uh, IV antibiotics in the ER and was discharged on oral antibiotics, a very uh, typical protocol, but she did not uh, fill her antibiotic prescription. She was using methamphetamines instead, and her hand became more, more swollen, painful, she had advancing redness in the forearms. There's a picture of the advancing redness and kind of where we had marked out the redness in the brachium. And then uh, she said, you know, now my finger's turning dark and it was, it was black essentially in the ER. So um, necrotizing soft tissue infections. Uh, these are, you know, in, in upper extremity uh, medicine, upper extremity surgery, these are uh, emergencies and uh, they're dangerous infections. Uh, they're difficult to diagnose. Uh, there's, it's always uh, compounded by difficult decision-making. Are we going to go to the OR right away or should we get a study? Um, if we go to the OR, what's our surgical plan going to be? Um, so the, all of those things can be uh, very difficult in treating soft tissue infections. And then um, what we want to avoid, uh, which is known to increase uh, morbidity and mortality, is delay in diagnosis, delay in treatment, which often uh, contributes to a bad outcome. So uh, we know that uh, this has been described even in antiquities. I'm not gonna go in detail uh, through this just for the sake of time, but Hippocrates even described this uh, in his writings as mal malignant erysipelas. And um, he said that the, some of the uh, characteristics of it was that there wasn't typical pus um, or an abscess uh, like other bac uh, bacterial infections or other infections, but the, um, the key was that they had a high mortality rate. In the United States, this was first uh, described, early descriptions of this were by uh, Jones in 1871, who had practiced during the Civil War. 
and they called it uh, rapidly uh, advancing fatal infection. He called uh, hospital gangrene. And then the first use of necrotizing fasciitis as a term was by Wilson in 1952. And uh, he described the um, infection involving the fascia spreading along fascial planes that the fascia was necrotic and used the term necro uh, ne necrotizing fasciitis. But today uh, we use the term necrotizing soft tissue infection, just indicating that all of the layers of the soft tissue can be involved. Of course, necrotizing fasciitis is the most common presentation, but um, even necrotic fat, necrotic muscle, um, indicating you know, that all the layers can be affected. So we use the term necrotizing soft tissue infection, but the diagnosis and the management uh, principles are shared. As far as epidemiology, the CDC uh, surveillance tax, task force uh, uh, in their data reported seven, uh, approximately 7.3 cases per 100,000 population. And in their surveillance data, it was a mortality rate of 24%. And um, the ranges of mortality reported in retrospective reviews range from 24 to 34%. Um, but risk factors uh, that put you at high risk for developing an infection that's necrotizing include a history of diabetes. So 71% of these cases, the patient had a history of diabetes. 43% had a history of illicit drug use. But there's higher rates of alcoholism and peripheral vascular disease as well. But important to understand is that approximately 40% of these necrotizing soft tissue cases, there was no known risk factor. It can be categorized into polymicrobial versus uh, monomicrobial. And uh, uh, the polymicrobial infections are the most common, including uh, bacteroides, Clostridium, Enterobacteriaceae, coli, Klebsiella, Proteus. And then the most common in the monomicrobial um, group would be group A strep. And of course, the uh, group A strep uh, releases a toxin, the exotoxin, and uh, even uh, MRSA has been shown to release a toxin called the Pantone Valentine leukocyte. But uh, associated as well are aeromonas infections, Vibrio, and the fungal infections. Uh, this is case number two that came from a gentleman who uh, was injured by a fish hook. I'm not going to go into detail with this one just for the sake of time, but essentially he had uh, some amount of immunosuppression. He did not have a diagnosis of RA and couldn't tell us who his rheumatologist was. He lived alone, didn't have very good insight into his own health care, but he was on daily prednisone and Plaquenil, which made us suspicious. And then he told us he had prediabetes. But what was important about this case is that what we thought was just a dorsal abscess of the thumb where he hit himself with the, with the um, fish hook. Uh, within two hours after presenting to our ER, he had signs of sepsis systemically and uh, hemorrhagic bullet, so rapidly uh, aggressive infection. But the clinical uh, presentation, what's important is to get a thorough history, so we're looking for those risk factors. On exam, they may or may not have a wound. There are cases that are reported where patients have no known wound or a history of trauma. Um, the hard clinical signs uh, that have been described include pain, so pain out of proportion, uh, swelling, bullet, and crepitus. Um, Having all four of those is a, a high uh, 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 specificity for, um, for a necrotizing soft tissue infection, but only about 44% uh, of cases have all four signs. So it's not as common to have all four, but you need to be thinking about those. And then um, the, uh, another uh, important uh, factor to remember is that um, the 83% uh, of patients who present will have signs of sepsis or shock. So that's, uh, that's a more common finding is that they'll have some type of systemic abnormality. And uh, a common finding uh, also includes a failure to respond to antibiotics as well as some patients will report a sense of impending doom. In uh, the early laboratory evaluation, we're looking at changes in the uh, CBC, uh, the metabolic panel, elevated C-reactive protein and sed rate as well as obtaining early blood cultures. Uh, factors that have been uh, seen across different studies include the presence of a low sodium in their electrolytes, high white blood cell count, and uh, a rising creatinine. This is so consistent that uh, Wong published uh, their uh, criteria in 2004, which was uh, looking at the different laboratory factors to see if they could distinguish between a necrotizing infection versus uh, a typical cellulitis. And what they looked at for their criteria included a high C-reactive protein, high white count, a, a dropping hemoglobin, low sodium, increasing creatinine, and uh, elevated glucose. And based on their criteria and their scoring system, if a patient had greater than six points, uh, that was suggestive of a necrotizing infection. 
they had greater than eight points that was predictive of a necrotizing soft tissue infection. Um, but uh, you know what's important to understand about the Lernet criteria is that it hasn't really been validated with prospective data. Um, there is a 2017 meta-analysis of studies looking at the Lernet criteria and uh, what they found that it was more helpful as a prognostic aid for, uh, so for example, it confirms severe cases and then it aids in predicting high-risk patients with poorer outcomes. Um, but again, it hasn't been uh, evaluated prospectively uh, for its validity. Um, and then another finding from the meta-analysis was that in extremity uh, necrotizing infections, they didn't have quite as a higher uh, rise in their larynx score. So that's important for us to understand for as extremity surgeons is that their larynx score may be low. And this is interesting because even in my hospital, they've started to include this uh, in the laboratory findings, uh, uh, you know, that you'll see their larynx scores reported in the lab values on the computer. But uh, for the uh, extremity infections, those did not have as classical uh, response and rise in values as the other sites, such as Fournay's green dream. Diagnostic studies, x-rays are often normal. You can see in this person that they have a gas-forming bacteria, they'll have subcutaneous uh, air formation, like in the first web space along the ulnar border of this radiograph. There's not a lot of data in the literature about the use of ultrasound. Um, there is more data for CT and MRI, but the caution that most authors give is that that can lead to a delay in diagnosis, a delay in treatment. So they're really only recommended in patients who are stable uh, systemically, have no signs of sepsis or shock, and uh, patients in which their infection is stable. But uh, CT has been shown to uh, be able to evaluate uh, edema in the soft tissues and thicknesses, uh, increased thickness of the uh, fascia along the fascial planes that are infected. And then the MRI is a little bit more uh, helpful for looking at uh, muscle involvement uh, uh, as well. But MRI had the worst delay as far as getting those uh, uh, results back in, in decision-making. So the authors cautioned uh, using those uh, only in patients who are stable. As far as treatment, the uh, key is to uh, use broad spectrum and multi-agent treatment covering all categories, including gram positive, gram negative, and uh, anaerobic, as well as MRSA. Uh, so kind of similar to what Dr. Mazera said about you know, using multi-agents, don't be uh, you know, um, cautious about going to a broad spectrum and covering multiple categories. Um, and then also considering uh, the toxins that are released by these, um, by these bacteria that uh, both clindamycin and linazolid uh, have anti-ribosomal uh, properties that give the patient two benefits. One is that it decreases the overall toxin production by toxin-producing bacteria. And then the second is that it potentiates the activity of um, the uh, uh, wall uh, antimicrobial agents, cell wall antimicrobial agents. And so it'll make those uh, uh, agents more effective against those bacteria. As far as uh, uh, IVIG, that's been well studied in the literature and then found to have no uh, benefit to patients. So we don't really recommend that uh, uh, anymore. And then there's not really data to support the use of hyperbaric, hyperbaric oxygen. But the hallmark of uh, early treatment is surgery. In fact, patients that are unstable and have advancing infections should be taken to the OR for emergent debridement. And uh, the, the pattern of your, your surgical plan is to include uh, getting above the zone of the spreading infection and spreading your edema. And you're looking for in the subcutaneous area, subcutaneous um, fat necrosis, fascia necrosis, so gray fascia, necrotic skin. So we make an incision in that area if the skin doesn't bleed, that indicates the ischemia. Um, in the subcutaneous fat, there'll be uh, classically thrombosed subcutaneous veins. And then uh, classically described, there's not real pus, but there's a ton of edematous fluid that comes out. It's like pouring fluid out of the wound. And uh, that's, it's usually dark in color, um, has a gray color. And so that's been described as dishwater pus, uh, indicating kind of like that gray water after you've hand washed a lot of plates. My wife will tell you, I do a lot of hand washing in my house. Dr. Mazzaro, have you know, I do that. And, uh, but to get back to the dishwater, yeah, it'll be dark in color and uh, it's, it's just uh, exuberant, like it's just more pus or more uh, fluid than you would expect. Um, and then deep cultures are important. Um, and then the second point in decision-making is, uh, so for example, in the, the digits that are necrotic already, those can be amputated. And the question is, should you be amputating part of the hand or uh, uh, at the wrist level or the elbow level? Typically in my center, we'll amputate all the digits that are necrotic We'll uh, get rid of all the necrotic skin and necrotic fat and fascia, 
So it leads to large wounds. And then uh, if the patient is stable and we've got and we've debrided a proximal to the zone of necrosis and erythema, we usually will stop at that point. But we always make a plan. So the kind of the last part of this slide is making a um, specific plan for handoff to the next surgeon. So quickly to finish here, because we're at the hour point, the morbidity and the mortality levels are high. This is a systemic review of 12 studies uh, by Angulas uh, looking at 455 patients. But um, look at the number, the average number of INDs was three per patient. I mean, and so a lot of them got more than three debridements. 88% uh, of patients required some amount of split thickness skin grafting just to, uh, regarding the number of um, the amount of skin that was removed. 4.5% uh, of patients required rotational flap to cover critical structures of the dorsal hand or elbow. And then they still had a high imputation rate of 18 to 22%. The mortality rate was very high of 22%. And the risk factors that, uh, that we think of for putting you at risk for developing infection are also the same risk factors that put you at risk for dying from the infection. The only modifiable risk factor that we have control of is the delay to surgery. And so uh, having a high index of suspicion, having a high um, uh, regard for you know, uh, evaluating the labs and getting early information and determining whether a patient should go to the uh, 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 OR urgently. And some of the delay is just the transfer from outside center. So some of that we can't control. So case number one, just really quickly, the first IND, we uh, amputated lung and index that were necrotic. All the necrotic skin and fat uh, in the forearm we debrided. Uh, and uh, you can see that in this area here, some of the bowler skin uh, was still alive, so we kept that, but all the dorsal skin was uh, debrided. And we debrided proximal to the erythematous margin, so we're at the elbow level, just proximal to the antecubital fossa. But even within 24 hours, my partner who I signed out to, she was uh, requiring more antibiotics in the ICU, so they went back and, and made incisions. They didn't de uh, debride necrotic skin, but they made incisions and debrided, debrided necrotic fat all the way up to the shoulder. That uh, second trip to the OR, she did much better. She was much more stable in the ICU. So we, we had another 48 hour uh, kind of uh, period where she was doing well, very stable, went back for a back change on IND, IND number three. Uh, she grew out, group A strep was the organism. Uh, by day six, she was stable and on the flow, floor and we did a groin flap for soft tissue coverage for the amputated area in the dorsal hand. And then, um, at three weeks, we completed uh, the section of the groin flap and split them to skin graft. And this is her final kind of a three-month uh, picture just showing the, how things have healed. She still has requiring therapy, has stiffness in the digits that remain. But overall, we were able to uh, salvage her upper extremity and uh, you know, save her uh, life. Um, case two, I'm not going to go to in detail, but just that this was kind of like a multi-organism uh, pattern. And uh, he lost all the skin of his hand and forearm. And he had uh, multiple derivements, older guy, wasn't very healthy, and uh, went on to uh, go on to uh, need uh, skin grafting. So uh, the principles are uh, trying to avoid delays in getting a rapid workup, initiating broad spectrum antibiotics right away, early debridement. These are, it's very rare that the people are going to be stable and that you can do close observation. But obviously, if they're systemically stable and their infection is stable, you can start IV antibiotics and do some close observation. But most of these patients, it's urgent. And you're going to be debriding to get to proximal control of the infection. And then you need to have a very thorough plan. What does progress mean? Like when you sign out to the next surgeon or if you're going to be on, you know, taking care of it the next 24, 48 hours, what are the decision points that you're going to make? Um, for taking them back to the OR and having a very clear plan. For me, I talked to my, my colleagues who are going to be in the OR the next day and just saying, hey, we, need to, we may need to move cases around or get this added on emergently. And, you know, can you help us with this? And we talk about where the debridement had been already and what we think the next level of debridement or the next level of amputation may need to be. Just because it, with delay of treatment, these have a high morbidity, high mortality, and you need to be thinking about getting more people uh, involved. These are my references. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, just kind of talk about the take home message for tonight's talk. For complex upper extremity infections, these are uncommon. They're difficult to diagnose, which often leads to delay and worsening a presentation of the infection. You need to have a high index of suspicion. And uh, typically, they require a combined surgical and antibiotic management and get others involved, get multiple people involved, even get senior partners involved, other services involved, often in decision making. So I want to highlight, uh, you know, ongoing um, uh, hand education committee talks. Our next uh, one for perilunate dislocation is in March 
of 2022. So um, uh, please be uh, thinking about joining us for other webinars that are coming up. And of course, a lot of our content is available on the web. In fact, tonight's talk will be available on YouTube as one of our YouTube talks that you can review. And then we have a Sage on Stage series that's ongoing. Please uh, check out the AO Trauma uh, North America website so you can see how you can get the podcast and access all of our Sage on Stage series of a lot of uh, interviews with um, experts in upper extremity and hand surgery. So anyways, we wanna finish with that. Are there any final questions that we didn't go over before we finish? No, I think we've, um, I think we've covered everything. Okay. Well, for the sake of time, we're five minutes after the hour. I wanna thank Dr. Mazera and Dr. Malone. Thank you for joining us this tonight and appreciate that and, and uh, wish uh, you all a great uh, holiday season here uh, around the uh, fall and the new year. And uh, we wish to see you uh, in the future for hand education uh, webinars. Thank you. Thank you.